One of the biggest paradigm shifts you can have about Christianity is if you understand that Constantine was not a Christian. And one of the most incited facts that he's a Christian is that he was baptized. And we're going to examine that and ask the question, did he truly give his consent? And uh, also, we just want to review here that uh, what his role in history was, this figure, why he, why did people insist that he's a Christian? Because he injected himself into the Nicene Conference in a significant way that changed Christianity forever. And basically, the Nicene Creed came up with the, you see the uh, quote at the bottom there? So this is from an encyclopedia in an article, Christianity's Roman Religion. And th that quote at the bottom there is the Council of Nicaea decision of 325, not the later creed that you may have heard. This is how it was done originally. And this article is saying the Council of Nicaea rejected Arius's position. So this is the position that did not accept Jesus was God and adopted the Nicene Creed, which read in part, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty. Well, that was Arius's position. There was only one God, the Father Almighty. So at first you have to wonder, is this article making any sense? But this is, you'll see why. And, uh, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ. Well, again, that's completely consistent with actually John 17, one to three. This is virtually a verbatim quote of what Jesus said. The only true God is the father and eternal life is to believe in the only true God, the father and his son, Jesus Christ. And it says right there, the son of God. So you have no doubt that they're not the same being. They're distinct. They have different names and titles. One's God, the father, and one is the son of God. So how do we, how do we end up having a problem here? And then it says the only begotten of his father. Well, we can put that to one side. It doesn't really say when it was happened, but in that day, the baptismal accounts of Jesus's uh, father from heaven saying this day I begotten, he would have been recognized immediately by most participants is still present in the Bible. It was only removed in four or five AD. So in 325, it was 75, 30 years away from being erased from both Matthew and Luke, this day I begotten thee at the baptism of Jesus, because that offended the Nicene Creed that that said that Jesus was an eternal son of God. And that, and we'll see that's the implication of the next words coming up. So the words, this day I begotten thee had to be erased and removed. And Jerome did so from Matthew and Luke. Uh, they exist in the oldest manuscripts and they will go all the way back to the original Hebrew Matthew as well. It, Jerome himself saw and, and, and Epiphanes saw it. And Epiphanes quoted this day I begotten thee from the earliest Hebrew Matthew from the hand of the apostle Matthew. So that would be what people would understand most of them, but being the begotten, first begotten son of God of God, that was sort of like a new order of being from the baptism on of Jesus. But there it is. What, what happens suddenly that ellipsis there, it becomes God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Well, how did we go from things that are totally normative to, to Jesus is God of God, light of light, very God of very God? Well, that came from Constantine. He brought in the Hamusian doctrine, which is means the same substance. So Jesus, the son, was of the same substance of the father. And that's what gave Jesus deity. So therefore, Constantine has an outsized, huge role in changing Christianity because that is fundamentally taking a clear doctrine of Jesus Christ from John 17, 1 to 3, and that's everything up to the point of the Son of God. Then the only begotten of his Father is really uh, not clear which portion of Scripture we're looking at. Paul talks about it one way, but Apostle Matthew and Luke talk about it being begotten at the baptism of Jesus. So this is uh, uh, unclear. That's the only thing that's unclear. But otherwise, how did we get to God? Jesus being God, it was by Constantine. He's the one who told us Jesus is God, and we accepted it from him. All right, so we'll move on. <clears throat> now, since he's the only source for the transition from one God, the Father, to God of God, using the Hamusian doctrine, we need to know, is the person giving us this, even a Christian, ever was a Christian? Or was he even a Christian at his time of death? And most people, there's very, there's no evidence really that he was Christian before he reached death. But if if you uh, 
push people on it, they'll say, well, he, he was baptized at his death. Therefore, he's a Christian. So this episode is going to show you the evidence that he was Christian beforehand is, is not, not even significant. And the only evidence to really deal with this issue is the baptism. And we're going to disprove that is truly a consensual baptism. Okay, so we're going to uh, ask the quickly the question about was his vision of the uh, it's saying in this sign you will conquer and that's an ambiguous question of what what did he see and some people think it's the Cairo or whatever which by the way is a pagan sign but he pulled that one over our eyes that was used in the second and third century BC as a pagan symbol in uh, Greek speaking Egypt and he would know that but dumb Christians, we wouldn't know that Cairo came from paganism, but we took it. It meant good omen, C-R. Uh, the Cairo is C, the letter C and R that begins the word crestus, which means good. And in Greek uh, pagan literature, that meant good omen. And that's all it meant. And he conned us to believe that was a symbol. I'm not even going to discuss that. That is so obviously disproven as, as, as a veritable symbol. But he was claiming that he and his men saw a vision in the sky, probably the Cairo, uh, that said, in this symbol, you shall conquer. So that basically, if you put that symbol on your shields, you will now win. So that's in theory when the Cairo was put on the shields of the men. And then what happens next? He's going to do a coin and strike a coin to celebrate the victory. And he's going to also do a Constantine's arch, which is still at Rome. We already have covered the Constantine arch before, and that shows absolutely no reference to Jesus Christ or any symbolism of Christianity. And it thanks the God of the sun, Sol Invictus, at the highest point of the arch. And it, otherwise, it has a lot of pagan gods on the uh, bottom levels. So really, it has, has nothing to do with Christianity. It doesn't give any thanks to Christ. So if that really happened in 312, 310, 312 AD, he, he gave no thanks to Jesus for it at that time. And then the only, we, we have something new here to show you, which is an actual coin that was struck to commemorate his victory at Milvian Bridge. And you'll see the same pattern. This is his pattern of himself. He's the first facing character. And there's a shield. And behind him or next to him on his right side, which is to left of his face, is a image with a person who has a solar crown on his head. That's Sol Invictus. And then if you look on his shield on Constantine's left arm, you see that that is an actual chariot. So here is how it's described, uh, uh, the web page that shows this, this coin. This is a coin from 313. So it says, the bust of Sol Invictus on the left in this image and Constantine holding a shield bearing the emblem of the Sol chariot, the chariot that Sol, the god of the sun, rides in. It's a gold solidus minted in Tycinium in 313 AD to commemorate Constantine's victory at the Milvian Bridge. Absolutely, totally pagan. No thanks to Christ at all. Thanks to a pagan god, Sol Invictus. So uh, then I found an article from History Today that says it's unquestionable that Constantine was a Christian and gives you the evidence. And so let's just qu quickly review that because we're trying to isolate was he a Christian ever? But we, I think this is very so, so pathetically uh, works the other way that we don't have to really give this serious credence. But what we have to deal with is, was he baptized? So that's the aim of this episode. But let's just review this quickly. History today. What what is not in doubt is that Constantine became a believing Christian who vigorously promoted Christianity without trying to force it down pagan throats. History Today magazine. OK. Shocking. Uh, but totally wrong. And even the evidence they provide you is wrong Diocle or, or misinterpreted. Gale Diocletian and Galerius, these are co-emperors uh, prior to Constantine uh, in a different part of uh, the empire, had persecuted the Christians savagely. But in AD 311, Galerius had granted them freedom of worship. So was this idea of giving uh, Christian troops freedom of worship uh, new? No. So it's not unique with Constantine. It has nothing to do with being a Christian. It's just simply Galerius isn't a Christian. Nobody claims he's a Christian. It's, you know, you could persecute your troops for uh, their belief systems. As long as it doesn't interfere with your management of them as uh, soldiers, then why do you care? So you, you, and if they want to pray to their God before they get killed, let them do so. So this is, this is just practicality. 
and, and people make a lot of it more than they should. So in AD 313, Constantine does a similar thing. And this actually was a co, he was acting with a co-emperor as well in the Edict of Milan, where he proclaimed basically the freedom of worship as well uh, of Christians. He appointed Christians a high office. So what? <laughs> and he gave Christian priests the same privileges as pagan ones. So what? That doesn't prove he's a Christian. It's just he's practical. He's allowing a religion to even operate. The, allowing it to operate legally doesn't mean he's a believer. Okay? And people will say, well, when he tells us later, he's going to tell us, us much later in the 320s that he's been a Christian because of a sign he saw in 312 AD when it really was in 310 AD. So that was another thing. He even lied about the date. Uh, anyway, because a book was written. A book was written contemporaneously that it happened in 310 AD, and it was with the God of the Son, Apollo, not with Christ. He saw a similar vision in the sky. Was that a coincidence? No. He's, he's, he's embellishing something that, that may have actually happened in 310 AD, something he saw in the sky, and he interpreted it from Apollo. Then later, when he wants to con us Christians, he tells us, takes that same story and repackages it, and tells us it was really about the sign of uh, from Jesus, CR, the Cairo in the sky. And I saw this in the sky, and he told me, in this sign you will conquer. So I put it on the guy's shield, and that's how we win the battle. When now we know the Cairo was a pagan term uh, anyway, and it meant crestus, and it meant good omen, and it would put was put on pagan uh, relief in certain coins from the Egyptian Ptolemy, Ptolemy, uh, nation of Egypt uh, in 200 BC, 300 BC, hundreds of years before Jesus. The Cairo is a pagan uh, 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 art in pagan uh, uh, images of pagan gods. So, and it just meant good omen. Anyway, then it says this by AD 323, the birthday of Psalm Victus on December 25th had become the birthday of Christ. They're claiming that proves he's a Christian. Uh, excuse me. No, 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 no. If you got rid of the birthday of Psalm Victus and you, you quashed those uh, games and celebrations and all that, and the worship of Psalm Victus, that would be something, but that's not what he does. He doesn't ban paganism. And I'm not saying he should, but you can't claim he's a Christian because he then says, okay, Christians, you can celebrate the birthday of Christ on December 25th. In fact, I think you should. Now, you know, I just have to say this. I'm trusting Christ history today to even mention this to you because I, this is the only place I've ever seen it mentioned this early. I know that it became a mandatory thing to uh, celebrate Christmas. I think it was in 363 AD at Rome uh, on, on December 25th. But what this is saying is that Constantine had already uh, supported the idea that this would be done as early as 323 AD. Now that's really remarkable. So I'm going to verify that later. But th that's not. E but let's just assume it's true. It's not evidence he's a Christian. It just assume it actually proves he wants us to be a syncretic, syncretic religion, meaning. He wants to make us synchronized to his true religion. He's a Sol Invictus fan, no doubt about it. And he wants us to be worshiping on the same day in the same way and celebrate the same way as the people who follow Sol Invictus. And that's his old goal, that we would be unwittingly brought along by syncretic uh, 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 celebrations of the same holidays as the pagan religion of Sol Invictus. The emperor strove to iron out theological disagreements. This is the next sentence here. And in AD 325, he personally attended the Council of Nicaea. Now, that makes it sound like he's just one of the crowd, you know. No, he ordered us to go to Nicaea. As Pontifex Maximus, he had legal authority over every religion in Rome, including the Christian one. And he could order us to show up at a certain place, and he's going to tell us what our doctrine is going to be, because he is the high priest by law. Somebody was saying, oh, you're saying Constantine was a high priest of Christianity. That's ridiculous. You don't understand. This is Roman law and had been Roman law since Augustus, Caesar Augustus. OK, so so this goes all the way back to the first century A.D. or the last century of the, uh, the B.C. era. So this is not new with Constantine. It's just it's just the way the emperors operated. They could tell the religious people to do anything they wanted. We'd have to believe anything they changed our religion to include or to exclude. We would have to do it because that's what their power was. Anyway, so it doesn't prove anything uh, that he wants. He's attending this council. It's it's instead he's actually ordering us to show up there. And then it said it formulated the doctrine of the Trinity there. 
That's not true. It was the by deity of Christ. A lot of Christians don't know this. The Trinity doesn't come into play until 381 AD in what's called the Council of Constantinople. And it's a totally different council. And uh, it's run by Gregory of Nyssa, a bishop. And he writes a book called The Great Catechism, explaining why they're doing it. And uh, Philip Schaff summarizes that book as saying that the justification in 381 was to finally put an end to the, quote, myth of monotheism. That was Gregory of Nyssa's purpose, Philip Schaff says, a Protestant historian of great value and worth. And uh, if you read the book, and I have it excerpted at length, you can only walk away with the same conclusion, because over and over again, Gregory of Nyssa says, this is, we need to believe in a third God now, because there's some error as to the one, meaning Jesus and, and the Father. So to, to erase that, we have to add a third God to add more complexity so that they realize that there is a God head of three beings that, you know, this is, this will get rid of this whole problem about Arianism and there's a father and son. And if we had a third God, that's kind of complicated and they're going to have to go along with one God, three and one gods. And that'll really prove that you can't have one God who isn't a multiplicity of gods within himself. I kid you not, Gregory of Nyssa, it's a book called The Great Catechism. Look it up online, read it, and you just go, this is a completely pagan man, whoever this was who wrote this. And that's why Philip Schaff says this book was designed to prove, disprove monotheism is true. Monotheism is false, in other words, is what the point of the Council of Constantinople that decreed the Trinity. That was its objective explicitly and it explained in a book <laughs> immediately thereafter. But I digress. Let's get back to this. Anyway. He, Constantine, also built magnificent churches, including Santa Sophia in his capital city of Byzantium, renamed Constantinople. Well, that's actually disputable. People say he didn't build any churches except the church to the 12 apostles, and there's no evidence that the Sophia church had ever been actually made. It was conceived but never executed. And now there are churches that are called the Church of Sophia now, but that, there were centuries that followed Constantine's death that that church was built. So just to show you how people get confused, and he, the only church he apparently ever ordered built was the Church of the Twelve Apostles, but that was really his mausoleum, and it was a secret project. He didn't tell Eusebius he intended to use this church as his mausoleum to prove to where people would come worship him, Constantine, and where, well, we'll get into it later, and uh, you'll see he wanted himself worshipped. Uh, he put the 12 sarcophagi of the 12 apostles around himself. And he would, when he died, he would be put in the center. And Eusebius of uh, Caesarea was upset, like, wow, you didn't tell me. All right. Uh, when he died in AD 337, Christianity was well on its way to becoming the state religion of the Roman Empire. And Constantine considered himself the 13th apostle of Jesus Christ. So what does he mean by that? Well, some people like to say that, remember I told you that the 12 apostles were in different sarcophagi, different, you know, coffin-like objects or monuments, that they were uh, in, put in a circle inside of a mausoleum, basically a large, looks like a large church. I, we have a video on that and it shows you the, the layout of it. And these 12 sarcophagi are in a perfect circle. And everybody assumed that... Constantine was going to have himself put alongside them, not inside the center, but that was the order that he gave his his loyal followers, his loyal obedient servants who weren't Christians. That's where it ended up, and they were in sh the Christians were all in shock. And Eusebius of Caesarea, his his psychophant, the, the the one Christian bishop or who was constantly praising him and making him sound like a hero. Was he said he never told me this was what he intended to do to put himself in the middle of it. He was in shock and very much disgusted. It seemed, and eventually, not shortly thereafter, mysteriously, the the sarcophagus of Constantine is removed, and uh, Chrysostom, a later fourteen, uh, a later bishop from the f late three hundreds, early four hundred, says, "Well, we just decided that we're not going to have that in the middle, so we took it out, <laughs> and nobody knows where the body of Constantine is since then." It's a mystery. So the Christians took care of that. Uh, they So the people understood it's this guy. Christians had to have learned later there's something wrong. We can't. Why do we think he's a Christian? Anyway, now I think I've shown you there's no way there's any evidence he was Christian before he dies. So the only question is, did he become a Christian 
before he died by baptism. Because most of us think, well, if you go through baptism and you say all the right things, you, m most Christians wouldn't go through all that unless you're really a Christian. Okay, because it's, 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 you know, uh, that, you know, it'd be an affront to God to go through all that and not be truly a believer in Christ. So don't do that if you're not a believer in Christ. Okay, so uh, he, uh, you see, there, so there's another Eusebius, not Eusebius of Caesarea, the historian that you're all familiar with. This is Eusebius of Nicomedia, and he's a very important person in world history. And I, I don't want to say anywhere close to Constantine, but he, he is an important person to know the history of his life. He was a cousin of the Emperor Constantine, although Wikipedia says he was distantly related. I don't think people who are cousins are distantly related. He was actually closely related, but not of the same, as, as close as a son or, da or, or daughter would be. They describe him as a fervent supporter of Arius, quote, and this is, this is where we're getting on to the baptism issue who baptized Constantine the Great on his deathbed in 337. So who's the one person who knows about this? His family member. And where is this taking place? Eusebius baptized Constantine in his villa in Nicomedia. And, and that means Eusebius' villa in Nicomedia. So that, remember, he's the bishop of Nicomedia. So this is in his home. So he is taking Constantine into his home, a very private place where family alone would have access. So this is not going to be a crowd of bishops from Constantinople or Nicaea coming over to the house and, you know, paying respects. This is a very private place where he could say anything he wants happened and we're, you know, we don't have any way of proving or disproving it. There's no witnesses. You'll see there's, re there's actually very scanty proof of how and why this happened at all. It's just his word, whatever happened. Uh, it happened in his villa on May 22, 337, just before the death of the emperor. So the way he left it is people understood this was Constantine is dying. He's on his deathbed. He's not got much longer to live. And this is at the point he gets baptized, but not like, you know, getting up and going and go, going to some water or something. It's literally going to happen on his bath, a deathbed. Uh, now, but what happened was there was a later story that was created and then made to appear that it occurred, that was written earlier at the time of Constantine's death. And it was a fifth century legend. This is um, in Wikipedia uh, in the article Eusebius of Nicomedia. A fifth century legend evolved that Pope St. Sylvester I was the one to baptize Constantine, but this is dismissed by scholars as a forgery to amend the historical memory of the Arian baptism that the emperor received at the end of his life and instead to attribute an unequivocally orthodox baptism to him. Well, uh, we know it's a forgery without even having to do any research additionally because everybody knows Sylvester was the bishop of Rome, the most important bishop of of the christian church in terms of influence and power and one of the weird things about the council of nicaea is why in the world did constantine the emperor of rome who had created a second capital at constantinople why wouldn't you have held it in rome when you full well knew that sylvester can't even walk <laughs> let alone travel all the way to nicaea he was disabled he could not walk he was very weak and so the the surmise or the inference is that he picked Constantine picked Con, uh, uh, Nicaea, which is forty three miles outside of Constantinople, deliberately. So so the Pope, the le the leading bishop of the Christian Church of all of Christendom, doesn't get a chance to attend and have any influence because obviously, how do we know what Con Sylvester's true views are and that this whole idea that he he uh, uh, he baptized Constantine. No, Sylvester never, and he had plenty of time, never signs the article in Nicaea himself. So there is no signature from the Pope of Rome ever approving the Council of Nicaea decision. Did you know that? And this is even in the Catholic Encyclopedia that they go, well, even though there's no evidence that he ever signed it, his legates who were there at, uh, at uh, uh, Nicaea did. So he sent two legates to be there. And they signed. Well, of course they did because they were all under threat of death, as we'll see. So, uh, or exile, I should say, but which is a death sentence normally. Uh, so he doesn't he doesn't sign it when it can, when it comes back. Well, that would be the natural time to sign it to show that you consent. But he didn't consent, and he never signs it. 
and even the Catholic Church tells it, tells it, although they try to spin it so it doesn't sound as bad as it should be. Anyway, so if he doesn't sign it, this whole idea that he's going to baptize Constantine, this this man who did something so egregious that you don't agree with, and it's his responsibility, it's his choice to say the Hamusian doctrine is how Jesus becomes God, even though when you read John 17, 1 to 3, you would end right there. You don't have any Hamusian to say that Jesus is God and true God from true God. This is all made up words. These are None of these words are in the Bible. None. Just made up words. You can't build creeds based on fiction, and that's what Constantine did. He built it on fiction and said, this is what you're going to believe, and he had the power and the right to do that because he's the pontifex maximus, and people ignore that now, but everybody in that room knew why they were ordered there. They were ordered by somebody who had the power to order them because he is their pontifex maximus as well as emperor of Rome. So anyway, uh, but you can see that Eusebius uh, this tells you something, though, that why he's going to lie and exaggerate that he baptizes a person who's co still conscious or implies, it leaves it up to you to guess, that that Constantine is still somehow not completely dead yet. So I've done this before he dies. So I don't think baptizing somebody after he's dead is going to send him to heaven or be considered the baptism that Jesus talks about. So... Uh, so let's turn to a logic lesson. If X is true, what else must also be true? We tried explaining that is a great way of investigating and coming to reasonable conclusions from evidence. So if Constantine had a true baptism, he had to give instructions first to one, remove Divis from the consecration coin that officially declares himself to be God. So let's take a look at that for a second. So the word divis, we didn't do this in the last video, so I wanted to do it here. So if you looked it up in Google Translate, divis means God. If you wanted to say divine, you say divinis. So some people don't like the word div divis for Constantine because they know that means he's completely claiming he's God. So they try to claim divis means divine. It does not. The only way to say God is divis. So divinis means how to say divine. So anyway, in the Dictionary of Roman Coins, we learned that the divis is a mark of consecration. The word divis given to anyone on a coin indicates that the same was struck after his apotheosis, where they've risen to be God. A question has been raised among the learned whether there be any distinction between deum and divum. And uh, so, whoa. So I, I think uh, there's one person who claims that uh, you could make a distinction claiming that gods from eternity are Dei and Divi are gods created by among human beings, are made de deities by human beings. There's no basis at all to that. Okay. Uh, Eckel, a scholar, also consulting the old writers, seems to be the opinion that there is no difference in the meaning of the two names as used on coins. It means God. You could say Dei or you can say uh, Divis. There's the same thing. He observed that the word divis was always turned by the Greeks into theos, which certainly is the deus of the Latins. Thus where, hold on. Thus where the latter inscribed divis, Augustus divo caro, the former wrote theos. And then the, the rest of it is uh, the, the, the word. So theos is the word meaning of the word divis. And that's how the Greeks even translated divis into Greek. And there, this is a breakdown of a, a more in-depth uh, look at the dictionary of Roman coins that goes into more depth about this. So let's take a look at this. This is page 337. This is quoted in the, U, in the URL that's at the bottom of the page, forumancientcoins.com, dictionary of Roman coins, slash dictionary by page. So this is specifically referring to the Divis Constantin, Constantinus reference on that coin, his consecration coin. It says Divis Constantinus. He had a veiled head, so on and so forth. And and in that description, it says, such are the terms in which the learned echo enamored birds on the legend Divis Constantinus. So why is that the legend meaning the, the words on the legend of a coin? And he says, we here find him expressing his opinion that there is nothing in these coins, not even in the appellation of Divis, as applied to create a being which can possibly offensive, be offensive to his, Constantine's religion. Now, to our religion, 
and he means the Christian religion, nothing can be more offensive than this potentious medley of Christian symbols and pagan superstitions, these titles of polytheism, that a man can be God, and false worship conjoined with the name and monogram of God's true and only son. So somewhere there's a monogram, small, very small writing uh, of, of apparently Jesus' name, somewhere on that coin. But constant, and we don't even know why it's there. He, that's not, doesn't appear to have been his instructions. And it's not noted by the British Museum in its summary of what was on the coin. So somebody put it there in this particular coin that he's referencing, but apparently it was not on the standard coin. But Constantine was indeed, this is, this is the, uh, the Eklund, uh, I believe this is Eklund uh, discussing this. And he says, but Constantine was indeed no Christian except politically. See his coins, Salai and Victo. So the the, or at least it's the encyclopedia writer of, of this dictionary of Roman coins. So uh, this has to be something that Constantine cannot leave. He instructed this to be done. Call me God, Constantine. That's not a small issue. And, and you can look at all the, cons con I looked at four different consecration coins and none of them used the word divis with their own name. They didn't, never did that. So that's a completely uh, uh, over the top, reference to Constantine, to himself as God. All right, so now let's go back to the page where we're saying, what does, if it's, if Constantine had a true baptism, he must remove Divis from the consecration coin that officially declare himself to be God. Do you see how clear that is? He cannot leave that on his conscience and say, I'm, I'm going to get baptized, even though my coins are going to tell everyone I'm God. Two, he has to cancel his plan entirely that his sarcophagus goes inside and at the center of the circle of the 12 monument boxes that represent the 12 apostles. That makes him out to be Christ, as even the scholar uh, mentioned in his uh, recent, well, recent, his 1991 paper to the Patristic Conference, that that's what, was, that's what he understood, the fact that he's in the, Constantine is in the center. He's not a 13th apostle. He is claiming to be Christ and worthy of worship of the 12. And that's why they're around him. And Constantine is not on the same periphery looking towards the center area. All right. And then, so then the next thing is he has to tear down the statue of Apollo Psalm Victus at the Constantinople with his face as Apollo face. So we can see that statue here to the left. Uh, it's a, a grotesque thing. It was constructed between 324 and 328 AD and probably was an adequately completed by 325 at the time of co the Constantine uh, uh, Nicene Conference. And so those people probably walked through Constantinople on their way to Nicaea and saw this monstrosity of, a, of Constantine's face, if they rec could recognize him at that point in time, on the statue. So, uh, you know, this is, this is just an abomination, has to be taken down. How could he get baptized without making sure he's given instructions that that be removed? All right. So uh, enough said on what he must have done in repentance before he would be ba ever think of being baptized in any sincere way. And we know of no claim that any one of these things, let alone all three, which are all three mandatory, ever happened. And so the, the answer to this is that it could not be that the Baptism on Constantine's deathbed was done, done by a conscious human being who could make the decision to accept it or not. It was done passively on him, obviously, because he would have said, no, 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 you cannot baptize me until I give these three instructions, at least, or at least one or some effort. But there is no effort and no record of effort and no record by anyone of Constantine saying anything to anybody during this, quote, baptismal process, not even that he recited any statements during it is never recorded, let alone what we really need to see is this kind of evidence in one, two, or three. Okay, so I'll move on. Okay, so now what this means is I'm implying that Eusebius of Nicomedia was deliberately telling us that he baptized Constantine on his deathbed leading us to believe, because we know what the, the ritual or the rite of baptism is, requires responsive statements typically from the person being baptized. 
And so you would assume you wouldn't tell me someone's being baptized unless he was responsive. If you're just baptizing someone who's dead or virtually dead, meaning not able to communicate, that's not a baptism. That's just you laying hands on somebody. So let's listen. Let's examine. Could is Eusebius of Nicomedia a person who could have, who could be involved in misleading millions of people to think that Constantine became a Christian before he died? Because this is remember, this is what did that that History Today article say? It's it's a fact. He was a Christian because of all these other things that don't add up to a hill of beans. He's a Christian, well, but. If you can prove that there was no baptism, if there was no baptism, there was no evidence this man ever had any faith in Christ by anything else he did. In fact, all the opposite. So this the only the only possibility is it, if this baptism is real. But I'm telling you that the evidence, the three facts that he doesn't change proves that it didn't happen. Therefore, that means I'm in I'm implying clearly that Eusebius and Nicomania misled us by not being clear about this man was not conscious and did not make any effort to repent of sin or do anything that would be significant that we could believe he's a Christian. And he doesn't, but he doesn't, at the same time, he doesn't tell you he said anything and he doesn't tell you he's conscious. He just leaves it up to you to assume these things because of the nature of baptism. So let's see if he would be that kind of deceitful kind of a person. Eusebius of Nicomania was initially a bishop of Beritus, modern-day Beirut in Phoenicia. Well, that means he would usually be an honest person if he's risen up to that level. He later became bishop of Nicomedia before finally becoming archbishop of Constantinople. He was a heretic. Well, that's according to the Orthodox Wiki. So we're not looking at Wikipedia in this uh, thing. So the Orthodox view is Trinitarianism. And since this Eusebius of Nicomedia is not Trinitarian, He's a heretic. That's not a reason that we can decide that he would be dishonest because it, it, it just doesn't, it's just a doctrinal position. And uh, he's a supporter of Arius. Again, Arius is a, a, is a Christian bishop too, and he has Christian faith. He just believes in John 17, one to three. And frankly, I do too. So I wouldn't make him being a supporter of Arius uh, wrong. In fact, that would be a good thing. But I'm willing to hear evidence that he is not an honest person. So we're going to see if there's any such evidence that Eusebius of Nicomedia is not an honest person or not to be trusted. He used his influence. So uh, Eusebius of Nicomedia used his influence among the members of the family of Constantine the Great to further the Arian position as well as his own personal esteem. So he's he's using his his familiarity with his cousin to create personal esteem for himself. Uh, that doesn't mean he's dishonest. Okay, uh, let's look at this. E Edward Gibbon, Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. And I think he's trying to tell you that when this baptism happened, according to his opinion, was beyond con the point of being conscious. He was dead. According to the strictness of ecclesiastical language, the first of the Christian emperors was unworthy of that name till the moment of his death. That means that means he's saying like right seconds before he dies. That's as close as you. I mean, he's basically saying this is not a person who's probably very consciously aware of anything, since it was only during his last illness that he, at, at 337 A.D., received as a catechumen the imposition of hands and was afterward admitted by the initiatory rites of baptism into the number of the faithful. The Christian Christianity of Constantine must be allowed in a much more vague and qualified sense, meaning, you know, this isn't the way you and I would think normal Christianity operates, but we'll give him, the, we'll give him a pass and we'll say, you're in the club. We'll acknowledge that you did everything you're supposed to do to, to ritualistically be called a Christian. Well, if, if it's being done to you and you're not actively involved, to me, that's not true Christianity. And if you are not conscious, which, as I said, if he were conscious, he would have made three acts of repentance, all of them. And any one of them, you know, even one of them would have been a sign that he's he's thinking and, and was conscious. But any failure to do any one of them tends to show that he is not consciously aware of being baptized. That's my point. Okay, here's Edward Gibbon. Uh, he was born in 1737, died in 1794. So now here's Eusebius of Nicomedia. Now there's a positive and a negative to this quote. 
So it's important historically, though. He writes to his cousin, we committed an impious act, O prince, by subscribing to a blasphemy from fear of you. And he, by the word we, means to include two other people who signed the letter, but he wrote the letter. Eusebius wrote this letter. And those two others were Maris of Chalcedon and the- Theognis of Nicaea. So he's t- now historically, this is an important letter to prove that the idea that the Nicene Creed was voluntary is false, which we have met m- tons of evidence of that. So this is just a reminder that you know, Eusebius of Nicomedia signed the decree, the Nicene Creed, and he's recanting here. And, and he's telling Constantine, I only did this because I was afraid of you, my cousin. <laughs> Now, Wikipedia, in its summary of Eusebius, is basically going to um, ignore this quote and records that uh, he signed this confession to the Nicene Creed, Creed at the conference in which it is, quote, said that he subscribed with hand only and not heart, quoting uh, basically the church history of Rufinus at 10.5. And Rufinus is that same infamous guy we've talked about in other episodes where he just takes old works. He's, he's a fraudster. He's just unbelievable. So um, I wouldn't trust him anyway. But the words do seem to be consistent with this statement here. He signed from fear of you. So he wasn't sincerely signing. And that's what is said here by uh, in Rufinus's history, that he subscribed with hands only, but not in heart. So I think what we do have is proof that rather than having any character here and saying, no, I'm willing to be exiled, he, Eusebius of Nicom- Nicomedia, uh, did, signed, even though he didn't believe in it. And so he didn't even have an argument. So I think this this was true for a lot of people because, you know what, being exiled is a significant downside. I mean, you lose all your property, your family, your children, you're, you have to go live in a foreign country way, way out in the wilderness and uh, and you shouldn't survive more than a couple of years if you, know, you could keep running away from the thieves and robbers and crooks and maybe survive. And many did. Many did a couple of years, three years. Or maybe they found places they could go that would not be as dangerous as others or whatever. Or maybe people would take them in, Christians in certain communities, way out in the wilderness of the bar- barbarian lands. Who knows how they survived? But it's not something you want to voluntarily do. So eh, maybe you go, well, you know, what? Uh, this creed, it just has one half of it that I don't like, the true God from true God. And a- anybody can see that was made up and that's not in the Bible. So, you know what, maybe I'll sign. So oh, there's all kinds of rationalizations that could explain it. But it is not. It has a lack of integrity at the same time. So I would say this is evidence that Eusebius of Nicomedia was admitting that he was willing to be uh, coerced and therefore be deceived, deceiving even the person of Constantine who was the one mandating this. And let's go through that a little bit. Uh, a few months after Nicene Council, he was sent into exile. Due to, okay, so then, just so you know, Eusebius of Nicomedia, a few months after the Nicene Conference, where he signed on the dotted line, he finds out that he's actually now going to be exiled simply because he's been friends with areas who himself has been exiled. So, uh you know, Eusebius of Nicomedia is being friendly to the leader of the Arian party, Arius, and that's not good enough for people. So now, uh, now Eusebius, who did sign the Nicene Creed, he's still going to be exiled because he was just being friendly to Arius. Now, I want to explain what uh, what it meant for Eusebius to sign that document and why he signed that document and how that was presented to the bishops of, at Nicaea. So a lot of people don't visualize this and this Gibbon helps you see what's happening. Edward Gibbon says in the decline and fall of the Roman empire, page 319, that when emperor Constantine ratified, that is approved the Nicene Creed. So he's going to be the first in line to sign because he's the guy who created this Humusian thing and wants this agreed upon. He made a firm declaration that those who resisted the judgment of the Synod, meaning they refused to sign, must prepare themselves for an immediate exile. So without hesitation, if you don't sign, you're going to be you're going to be taken by the troops. I'm the emperor and you're going to be removed outside the realm of the the kingdom and the the, the realm of Rome. And that meant being sent to the northern part of England, which was considered barbarian land. And that's still part of the realm. And you'll be put beyond the point where 
you know, you can't come back into the Roman Empire. And so you would live, you know, in this barbaric land and try to survive. And that's and without your property, without your wife, without your children, all of this stuff. So that's a big penalty if you didn't go along. Uh, anyway, so I, uh, I, I don't like to judge someone else. What would I do in the same situation? Would I make r rationalizations to try to avoid this and sign this document anyway? Apparently that was an overwhelming view. Only five were willing to accept being exiled, but those were the courageous ones. And see that I would say those, those are the people we should hold up from. And I say, why? Of course you should re refuse to accept th th something that's not in the Bible, true God from true God, and God has a substance. It's ridiculous. So that was that was uh, why they should have refused. And in more importantly, as John 17, 1 to 3, was staring each one of them in the face as they signed that document. They were, they were looking at the first two lines, and it's all 17, 1 to 3. And they all knew what that meant. They'd all read John 17, 1 to 3. The Father is the only true God. I mean, Arius did not make it a secret. He, he spoke about it. That was what he was relying upon. The scholars all agree he was relying on John 17, 1 to 3. It's explicit. It's clear. It cannot be refuted. And and yet they signed. I, I, I th To me, that's the problem. Jesus could not be more clear that he's not God in John 17, 1 to 3. So how can I sign a document to avoid exile that would say that he is God. And, and, and to me, that's like you, you, one of the things you cannot ever do is commit idolatry and go to heaven. And can you say to God, well, I was coerced into that. God's saying you could have accepted exile. So I'm not sure in, in my own personal life is that that would be too costly a, a, a mistake, not mistake, but a, a, a conscious awareness of what I'm doing is wrong and still do it anyway. Yet only five out of 220 some guys said, hey, you know what? I'm going to stick by Jesus. I'm going to follow him. So I could I could say to you, I, I'm sure that's what I would do. But you know what? I, I put yourself in another man's shoe for five minutes and you might decide differently. And, and uh, you know, do you want to have be killed over something like this that could be changed next week? Which, by the way, Constantine completely reverses in a few years, which is often ignored. But we're going to cover it real quick. So, uh, now, here's here's the amazing thing. Eusebius of Nicomedia wins return from his cousin, cousin. He's allowed back in. And let's find out why. After the lapse of three years, meaning he's been exiled, he, that is Eusebius of Nicomedia, succeeded in regaining the imperial favor by convincing Constantine that Arius and his views do not conflict with the proclaimed Nicene Creed. So they can be reconciled. Well, half of it can, but not the true God from true God thing. After his return in 329, he brought the whole machinery of the state government into action in order to impose his views upon the church. Well, that's that's interesting. So the the Trinitarian party or the Bideity party of Nicaea, they had used all the machinery of the state against Eusebius of Nicomedia, right? Uh, first of all, Constantine forcing people to sign under pain of being exiled. And then Eusebius being friendly with Arius, even though he signed at Nicaea, he was now being exiled a few months after Nicaea because he was just even being friendly with Arius. So he knew what it meant to be subject to the machinery of the state. Now he is apparently willing to turn around and use the machinery of the state against people who believe in the Trinity, or the, excuse me, the by deity of Christ, that he's a deity. So uh, that to me is not learning your lesson that somebody can do something to you wrong doesn't mean you retaliate and do the very same same thing to them that they did to you that you know is wrong but that's what he's going to do allegedly and this is described in wikipedia he was described by modern historians as an ambitious intriguer and a consummate political player he was also described by ancient sources as high-handed person who was also aggressive in his dealings he also used his allies to spy on his opponents now nothing in there is that he's deliberately dishonest the most dishonest thing he's done so far is signing the, the Nicene Creed because he didn't believe what he was doing was right, yet he signed it. But this stuff is just, you know, uh, sniping at him. Uh, we need to look a little deeper. He was able to, now here's what I think is dishonest. <laughs> he was able to dislodge and exile three key opponents who espoused the first council of Nicaea. So, this is how he repays the people at Nicaea. It's his cousin, Constantine, who's now going to turn to be against the people who were formerly pro. Uh, he's going to turn Constantine to be now 
anti Athanasius, anti the, uh, the, the successful party at Nicaea, right? So uh, who's, who gets exiled? As Eustathius of Antioch in 330, but here's the key, Athanasius of Alexandria in 335. That was the leading uh, opponent at the Council of Nicaea, who most people say he won. Well, wait a minute, everybody, hold your horses. It's 335 and he's losing. <laughs> he, is, he is lost. He is now himself exiled. So from 325 to 335 is 10 years. So Arian, Arianism is back. And, and the Trinity, the deity doctrine is somehow looks like it's in the dust because Eusebius of Nicomedia has convinced Constantine to, to ban and exile Athanasius. So this just shows you, does Constantine have, have his own mind? Now, this is two, two years before he dies. Was he all, all there yet or still there yet? Was he having mental problems? I don't know, 335. He's doing crazy things. He's reversing himself on the Nicene Creed seemingly, and Marcellus of Ancyra in 336. This was no small feat, this is Wikipedia, since Athanasius was regarded as a man of God by Constantine. They're not even telling you. He was the winner at, at Nicaea. So this is, should be this should be underscored that this arguably implies that he was reversing his position about the ruling at the Council of Nicaea that he had set up and orchestrated. And both Eustathius and Athanasius held top positions in the church. Eusebius of Nic Nicomedia, the article continues, another major feat was his, Eusebius of Nicomedia's, appointment as the Patriarch of Constantinople by expelling Paul I of Constantinople. Paul would eventually return as Patriarch after Eusebius' death. Okay, so now we've seen that there is a basis to believe that Eusebius of Nicomedia was dishonest. He signed on to the uh, articles at Nicaea, even though he didn't believe in what he was signing. So he signed a document. Yes, coercion, but he didn't have enough integrity to say, no, I'd rather go in exile than rather than sign something that is false and biblically violates the words of Jesus in John 17, 1 to 3. Five people were willing to go into exile because they were going to stick by what Jesus taught in John 17, 1 to 3. But this guy, Eusebius of Nicomedia, didn't do that. So he showed a, a, some level of dishonesty. Also, I think there is some level of dishonesty in his using against the enemies of his own, meaning the uh, by deity party, the uh, Athanasian party. He used the same tactics of exclusion and exile against them that he obviously didn't want them to do to him and would have thought wasn't just as to him. And so instead of uh, turning the other cheek and also uh, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, in other words, instead of following Jesus's prescriptions on how to handle this, he's handling it in his own power and he's going to retaliate and, and show these people what power really means. And he's got Constantine now in his pocket and we're now going to exile you Athanasius out of the empire and see how you like it. That's, that is a wrong, unchristian thing to do. So he's not showing Christian character, and therefore he's the kind of person who would exploit his cousin in his death to uh, uh, allow, uh, allegedly, a baptism to take place over him. But, I, but I, the proof is mounting that it was not conscious, conscious, and therefore it's not a valid baptism. But uh, the evidence that was left behind by... Uh, this Eusebius of Nicomedia is inadequate to tell us one way or the other. Well, the answer we we can conclu conclude is he is deliberately misleading us, and that is his character. He doesn't have high levels of integrity. He didn't have integrity when he signed the Articles of Nicaea, and he doesn't seem to have integrity that once he got the bad end of the stick, uh, you know, he didn't like that. But when he had his chance, he went and, and basically was vindictive and he went after Athanasius and had him uh, barred from the kingdom. So this is this is uh, wrong in all kinds of ways. And of course, the parable of the tares, she said, leave them alone. We're not here to, to take people based on their opinion and exclude them from a, a fellowship. Jesus says that in the wheat and the tares parable, let the angels make these kind of decisions at the end of time. But that doesn't mean you are quiet and let the evil continue. You need to upbraid them and, and basically uh, uh, state Jesus's positions on all things so that this will keep 
the church solidly following Jesus and not somebody like Constantine, not someone like even Eusebius of Nicomedia, the, his cousin, who, uh, you know, at war, obviously not uh, any of the people on the uh, Trinity side because they were the ones acknowledging and, and themselves were also cowardly and allowing Constantine to push things to the point of kill, threatening exile. See, if I were a, a, a bishop of uh, uh, on the Athanasian side, I would have said, hey, Constantine, we don't need you to threaten them. Our truth is so valid, so biblically based, they should just either be convinced or not convinced, but we don't want anyone exiled if they don't agree with us on you know, our interpretation that Jesus is God. That's what they should have said, but they, they were cowards too, and they just stood there. So Athanasius has no character. Uh, Eusebius of Nicomedia has no character, but there are, there were five people who had character and stood up against Constantine and said, no, we're not signing. And those are the people who should be honored and remembered. And we, we do that in the prior episode. So anyway, that's, um, so he did not do what Constantine did not do what he should have done. Had he truly had a baptism, which was say, we're not proceeding. I have to get rid of this divis on the coin. I have to give instructions to revoke that and have all those coins melted back down and then turned into dust and, and back into gold and remelted to, to remove that. And I want something specifically about my baptism in there. I want a new image, something like that. And uh, if nothing else, they'll remove the thing that says he's God. And <laughs> of course, and then uh, cancel his plan. And when he dies, he's going to have a sarcophagus of himself in the center of the 12 apostles in, in a rotunda and not do that anymore. And, and, and if, and he shouldn't even be the 13th apostle. That's a, that's arrogance. He's a, he can't appoint himself a 13th apostle. He, I mean, he's a, if he's only become a Christian at his death, basically moments before his death, and he did all these evil things, he can't he can't ask uh, uh, Christians to acknowledge he's a thirteenth apostle. That's ridiculous. And uh, and then most importantly, he had to give instructions that the, the statue of himself as Apollo, Solomon Victus, at Constantine's Forum at Constantinople had to be pulled down. Instead, it stayed up there until 1106, 1106 AD, I think it was, when a gale force wind knocked it down. All right, everybody, I hope that helps understand uh, better that uh, we can conclusively say Constantine did not have a true baptism, no matter how the his, uh, his relative Eusebius of uh, Nicomedia tried to make it appear. That's not what happened. And uh, Constantine was not a Christian and clearly left it where he was claiming to be God, claiming that he was this Christ in this sarcophagus uh, mausoleum, that he had created this horror, like a horror show, a horror picture for everybody to see. And then he had already left behind the legacy that he was the same as Saul Invictus. He put his face in the statue in the center of Constantinople. And so it, it was just a horrible, horrible legacy. And that's how he actually died with those three things all in place all horrible, despicable deeds of a, of a demented uh, pagan uh, who believed he was an incarnation of God himself. All right, everybody, I hope that helped. Take care.